Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Coin Brief Podcast, episode number 20. Uh, Sean and Evan here uh, to talk about the latest news in the digital currency space, um, especially relating to Bitcoin. So uh, this week, we are going to talk about a couple of major things that came out this week. <coughs> Excuse me. Including side chains and um, a, a theft, a major theft that, that just happened recently. So let's start with the theft. Um, this is another cryptocurrency exchange that has gone under and the founder slash owner has completely disappeared with the money. Um, the culprit this time around is uh, Moolah. That's the parent company. And uh, earlier this year, they had bought uh, a different cryptocurrency exchange called MintPal um, after MintPal had some issues with security breaches and, and things of that nature. So Moolah acquired MintPal, and there were some grumblings about Moolah, you know, not being the best company uh, for the space. But you know they they did some pretty they did some good charity events. Um, I believe that it was mainly Moolah who who got the Doge car thing going earlier this year. Uh, so that was a big that. publicity stunt. There was good stuff about them, but um, now uh, it, it's 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 gone. Um, the website isn't working anymore, uh, and 1.5 million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Uh, has gone missing, as well as um, like uh, a few, a few, either a hundred thousand or like thirty thousand dollars worth of cryptocurrency from from Moolah. Um, so don't use <laughs> don't use bad exchanges. Um, what is was, Evan? What do you, what does this say about um, the state of? cryptocurrency exchanges that we we have another failure like this with so much money gone missing i'm not surprised it's going to happen a lot i yeah. mean you know we're still in the very early stages of the bitcoin economy a lot of people i think forget that because it just yeah they get so immersed in it it becomes like such a huge part of their daily lives that they see it as just this huge thing but we're actually you know like in the pretty early stages yeah, it's definitely. A, it's a good thing that these, um, I mean, it's not a good thing that these scammers are out there, but it's a good thing that their operations are going down. Yeah, um, and we all see it happening, too. Yeah, because we're, you know, the sooner the sooner they go down, the less money they're going to steal from people, and the faster we learn about it, and then we can adjust to it and demand, you know, higher standards for their successors. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Um like, yeah, it sucks that the money got stolen, but I don't know why we would want a company to continue running when its, you know, leader is a well-known scammer who's been caught several times in the past. Yeah, apparently he's changed his name like four different times. Uh, like he's he's all his name as we currently know him is Alex Green, but he was previously known as Ryan Kennedy, Ryan Albright, Ryan Fletcher. And Ryan Gentle, these are all different names of the same person, who has like, you know, done numerous failed startups, um, and well, not just failed, but like, uh, like just straight up immoral um, practices. Scam. Yeah, just scams. Um, and like when when he started when he started Moolah and Moolah came into the game and people see that this new company Moolah is is doing stuff in the exchange space, um, like some people wondered like who is this Alex Green guy? He has like no uh, history whatsoever behind him, like no digital footprint uh, whatsoever for this person named Alex Green. And uh, I guess you know people were right to be suspicious. Because uh, he did have a previous history, it's just that he did a decent job at the time of trying to cover it up and hide it, while he did, you know, carried out his his current scam, you know. And um, like we don't know 
if like moolah was planned from the beginning as a scam uh or if you know they really did like want to be a, a really great exchange at the beginning but then something went wrong um which is you know what what some people think happened with mount gox back in the day but like that's it's it's the wild wild west out here like there's there's people who are going to start up businesses where you don't know that much about them and like if if you as a user are using their service then um you got to be conscious of the risk that you're taking by putting your money there letting them hold your money for any amount of time um and yeah it's it's unfortunate. Like it's it's especially unfortunate how like MintPal was dragged into this. They had troubles earlier this year and then got bought out by by MooPal, and um, and MintPal was a pretty reliable exchange at one point in time. I used them sparingly, like maybe once or twice to to exchange for some some random cryptocurrency, uh, and they had a really nice site design. Uh, it was intuitive, easy to use. Uh, smooth interface um but they just like it's it's too bad they didn't retain any sort of like autonomy when they were bought out by moo pal now the moo pal goes down mint pal goes with them and like it, that's that's like two um two major you know failures rolled up into into one because of the acquisition earlier this year yeah, and I think it's also another great example of why you shouldn't keep any money at all in an exchange wallet because he got away with um, what CCN reported was that he, um, he shut down MintPal and there were a hundred and thirty thousand dollars worth of cryptocurrencies and mint pals reserves that just disappeared when he shut down okay so you know that's people who are storing uh money in their exchange wallets and you know it's just further proof that you don't have any control over an online wallet yeah so i'm i'm gonna go out on a limb i think that that what was that a hundred thirty thousand that they say came from the wallets on mint pal I think that was like alternative cryptocurrencies, and then um, it was 1.43 million dollars of of Bitcoin that was stolen, according to the Guardian. And Bitcoin Bitcoin's um, public nature of the blockchain allows us to follow that money and and see you know what addresses it goes to. And apparently people have looked at that and said that 1.43 million dollars of Bitcoin has flowed into one specific address and one of the major investors in MintPal says that that address is controlled by Alex Green. So this guy isn't even that smart apparently because you yeah. think that he would have mixed his coins or something uh, like instead of allowing everyone to see that it, this mass of money is in an an account that he controls. Like, dude, you gotta you you change your name so much, you should know how to mix your coins. What's the what's the problem? Yeah, that's the first thing I would do is put it through a pay mixer on. You know, they have several on the deep web. Yeah. Uh, and they've gotten more reliable too over the past yeah. year. I would have put it through a mixer and into a fresh address on a fresh wallet and you know he could have gotten away with it because then he would have completely disappeared yeah yeah um but then and also he, may, he still might try and do that but it's surprising that he didn't yeah. do that as of the guardian article getting published yeah like i would have i would have done that right away if i was the scammer and i had like a million dollars worth of bitcoin that would be the first thing i would i would have done yeah you instead know? of putting like, it directly into your personal wallet that other people yeah. know you control yeah, and even even if even if it was on like multiple addresses, um, I, w I wouldn't consolidate them all in, into one address. I would just, you know, send it through the mixer in bits and pieces. That would be even better. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And that um, way, that way, the mixer. If you're using a third-party mixer, you don't run the risk of them taking, you know, all your money all at once too. Yeah. 
We're basically uh, giving you a guide, Alex Green, for your next endeavor, basically. <laughs> if, you're, if you're listening, this is what you need to do. We're helping yeah. you out. You messed up, dude. Um, but we also have Bitstamp saying that they're monitor- monitoring their uh, their activity, and they're going to try to stop any possible attempts from him to launder his bitcoins to you know put them through the exchange and get cash for them yeah so i guess they're they probably they've got an eye on that address as well and yeah. they're not going to let him deposit from that address into his bitstamp account so that's that's one less avenue for him to cash out basically although there are definitely several others yep um and also i read and i think it was the ccn article they wrote pretty good article about them so um about the whole they did a really good job of summarizing the whole like drama that went down but uh it was the department of justice and the sec which is the securities exchange commission are you know in the process of hunting him down right now so it's pretty serious i mean that's what ccn says anyways but um yeah and and hunting down that could mean like a few different things. Yeah. Well, it says the article says currently in pursuit. Currently in in pursuit. Okay. Yeah. Um, I doubt that they're going after him like, like physically, because number one, they probably don't know exactly where he is. Um, he's probably not in the United States. I, I think, based on the Guardian article, I think he was in um, in the UK. Uh. So it'd, it'd be hard to for the FBI and anyone to chase him down if he's in a foreign country. Okay, so they link to another article, another CCN article. Um, what they mean by currently in pursuit is the SEC is investigating Mupe plus seven other companies. Huh, okay. And suspicious activity. Ah. So. So that's, mm, that's business as usual for the SEC. Yeah, yeah doesn't like one thing is for sure these people aren't going to get their money back oh yeah even if the sec catches alex green or fbi or whatever even if he gets caught like i would be highly highly surprised if if anyone gets their money back yeah unless he's just incredibly stupid he's gonna make those coins disappear Mm -hmm. and he's gonna put them on a paper wallet or something or a brain wallet and uh He's just going to wait for it to die down, and then he'll just, you know, do whatever he wants with it in little bits and pieces that are unnoticeable. <laughs> you know, I actually, I followed the Guardian link to um, this address that they say belongs to Alex Green, and that apparently the investor says belongs to him as well. Um, 3,700 bitcoins are in this account right now. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm just going to do a quick calculation right here to, to see if that um, matches the 1.4 million that was that was stolen. Um, Bitcoin price right now, uh, what, 300, 345? Yeah, that's where it was hovering around that, that the last time I checked. Okay. So based on that exchange rate, and the exchange rate has dropped a little bit in the past couple days, this guy has one point two million dollars. One point two seven million dollars in that account. <clears throat> That's crazy. That is crazy. This guy is loaded and he and he like like completely duped everyone who thought that Moopal was um a reliable, respectable company. And you know, just stolen. You know, it's it's theft basically. Um even though when people put their money on an exchange like that and and are giving up a certain amount of trust like to betray that trust of your users and then just run away with with all the money uh it, you know that that's a form of theft and and this guy is going to is in hiding now and he's probably going to change his name again he's not going to be Alex Green anymore maybe he'll go back to the Ryan name from before Alex Blue Alex Blue yeah. Is that a reference to a, to a TV show? No, it's show? just a different color. Oh, 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 I got you. I'm tired. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we'll have to keep a lookout for Alex Blue. If anyone tries to come out with a brand new uh, company called Palmu, <laughs> Palmu, <laughs> uh, started up by got some guy named Alex 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 Blue, Alex Silver, Alex Silver. That'd be a cool name. I could <laughs> I could see myself checking up that. I'll take Alex that in the end. Yeah. Um, so yeah, scumbag alert. Someone named Alex Green, previously known as Ryan, blah blah blah, uh, stolen one point four million dollars of Bitcoin. What are what are the what are the lessons that we can take from this ordeal? Like we've talked in the past about you know don't trust exchanges, but is that is that pretty much like reinforced with this latest uh, latest development? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess if we want to put a new spin on it we could give some advice to people actually running these startups and you know do a background check on the people you're going to hire mm. you know um, that might be a good idea yeah um, but other than that you know it's just the same old thing don't trust exchanges keep all your money on a desktop wallet or if you're super serious about security do paper wallets and you yeah. know a bunch of other things. Yeah. And, and M of N, multi sig, stuff like that. Yeah. And uh yeah, don't use an exchange wallet as your main wallet. It's just uh if you put if you put money into an exchange wallet, sell it immediately. Or if you buy any kind of currency and it gets deposited into your wallet, send it to your own wallet immediately. You know? Yeah. Because this is, I mean, Mt. Gox, we had Mt. Gox. Yep. Um, Mint Pal was hacked a few months ago over the summer, and now Mint Pal was shut down with a million dollars worth of Bitcoin plus $130,000 worth of altcoins. Um, Coinbase is starting to deny people withdrawals. Uh, Bitstamp yeah. is being a little bit shady. Yeah. The um, appeal of Bitcoin is that you can hold your own money yeah. yourself and you can be completely personally responsible for how secure your Bitcoin is. Yeah, and people really need to take advantage of that because, you know, with all those examples I just listed, it's very clear that there's no exchange that is, you know, completely safe, right? Solid, yeah. safe, legitimate. Even ones that Shady seem really stuff. great on the outside and, you know, have, even if they have venture capital behind them, even if they have a really nice interface, there's, there's still that single point of failure uh, where you don't have your own private keys holding your Bitcoin. Someone else has that and it's, it's part of their, part of their system on their website and they have the power to just take that and run away with it. Yep. <laughs> Like, have full control over your money. You got to not give people that control. And like, it took me a while to learn this. Like, you know, a year, a year and a half ago to two years ago, when I first started getting involved in Bitcoin, the only place you could really get it um, was Mt. Gox and local Bitcoins. But I mainly used Mt. Gox in the beginning. Back then, I, I held my coins on Mt. Gox because I didn't want to go through the hassle of downloading, installing Bitcoin QT, syncing the entire blockchain, um, you know, storing, you know, 15 gigabytes worth of Bitcoin data on my computer and all that. But that's not an excuse anymore because we have tons of great lightweight wallets uh, that are available that are, you know, open source and are reliable. And it's literally impossible for anyone to just run away with your private keys. Um, there's literally no excuse anymore to not hold uh, the majority of your wealth in a personal localized uh, wallet, which is, you know, that's a safe, um, that's a safe option for, for most cases. As long as your computer isn't riddled, riddled with uh, viruses or a key log or anything like that, mm -hmm. it's Use relatively Linux. safe. <laughs> Use Linux. Yeah. Um, or, or Mac, but now that can, that can get some viruses too. Um, yeah, I just, I just read that, um, that Linux is really safe because most Trojans are written for Windows. So 
still like even even today because i knew that was true a couple yeah. years ago well i just started using linux like a few months ago and that's when i read it so okay yeah i mean that makes sense most people still use windows especially you know most of the older generation um so yeah uh don't don't keep your coins on an exchange they'll go under they'll they'll lose it and it just opens yourself up to get scammed so yep um, my my last point that I want to touch on relating to the Moopal scandal is that um, do you think that this gives ammunition to the people who are pro bit license who look at yet another uh, failed exchange and say uh, the government should be you know doing background checks on these people who open exchanges should be tracking these to make sure that they're solvent. Um, does it does it bolster that argument at all? Do you think? Um, no, I don't think so. I I think pro bit licensed people will try to use might try to use this uh, this event to bolster their argument, but um, mm -hmm. so count counter the counter what, that ahead of them. What I would say is that if uh, if MintPal was or if uh, Mula was based in New York. Um, and bit license is in effect. Um, that means Mula and by association MuPay and MintPal would have government sanction to do what they're doing. Um, and not only that, but they would be the first ones in the game, and they would have an advantage over all the startups, the potential startups, because it would just be way too expensive. For the startups to um, to become compliant with all these things, so then not only would MintPal have been shut down and all the money stolen, um, but it would be so hard for new players to come into the game that there would be no alternative. There would be just a huge like a vacuum left. Mm -hmm. um, people would have nowhere to go, and so that would be way worse than what we have now which is you know that mintpal, mintpal is a major altcoin exchange so now we need another altcoin exchange there's good, probably going to be another one to come up to compete with cripsy and that wouldn't happen if there was if it was bit license if they had to get a bit license mm. because they would just have to spend you know who knows how many thousands of dollars hiring a security team being compliant with all these rules and regulations um so there'd just be nothing left to replace it. And I would say that that would make the Bitcoin economy worse off than how it's doing right now. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I pretty much agree. Um, I think that if the bit license were in effect and I mean, there's there's two there's two side there's two ways that like a theoretical like moolah could could go if they were going to be sub subject to the bit license is number one stay in new york comply and all that become like one of the dominant exchanges there who have a leg up on the competition because they have the initial capital to meet all the qu requirements of the bit license um but then they wouldn't have as much funds for uh innovation um doing new experiments with trading or you know uh, scaling up to to a larger user base, you know, there's all kinds of issues where they wouldn't have as much money for it. But the other side of it is, they could just avoid New York altogether if they wanted to keep going the scammy route, and just n not incorporate in New York, uh, do it somewhere else in the United States or even outside of the United States in a different country, uh, where they wouldn't have to uh, follow the bit license necessarily. And what's what's Ben Lasky going to do? Write them an angry worded letter that he doesn't like what they're doing? Um, so, like, <laughs> re requiring honest businesses to put all this upfront capital um, isn't necessarily going to prevent the scammy businesses from continuing to scam people in a different... Um, jurisdiction basically so um yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty much how it is it. that's pretty much how it is with any um restrictive regulation like that it you know it, it 
it restricts the the good guy's ability to to grow and yeah. expand and provide service to more people and does nothing to the criminals because they never followed the laws in the first place. Right. If they did, they wouldn't be criminals, right? Yeah. So I don't think this gives any justification to bit license, but I'm sure there could potentially be people who would try to use it to justify a bit license. But if I it would not be a very strong argument in my opinion. Okay. Um so uh from there let's let's transition to um other bit license talk really quick before we get into side chains later. Um, the comment period for the bit license just ended. Uh, we had a couple more companies uh, release their official comments at the very at the very end of the comment period, um, including um, BitPay and Circle, and which is not really a surprise because we've we've seen Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire come out. Um, about like a, a month ago against the bit license, but now the actual company circle has released their comments and You know, they've said a lot of things that we've uh, heard before concerning the concerning um, arguments against the license, you know, such as you know um, Requirements to track everyone's uh, transactions um, unreasonable privacy intrusions uh, things of that nature but um, are you? I, I'm curious. Are you? Are you optimistic that uh, that we'll get some changes out of this? Like some solid changes where they take out like the the really bad stuff that people are criticizing a lot and kind of leave it with some like kind of bare bones regulation um, that that does the things that are the least controversial. Or are they going to just say? Uh, screw you guys, we're going to regulate all we want and we're going to implement it mostly um, as we presented it earlier this year. Well, before we started recording, you mentioned that Ben Lossky made a statement that um, developers, uh, wallet providers, blah, 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 whoever else, the inno the innovative side of the Bitcoin economy, yes. uh he would make sure that those types of businesses would not be affected by bit license. So I get, you know, I guess, I guess that's a thing. Like, you know, that's, that's something they've taken out because most people who submitted comments have said that, um, that the vague wording of the proposal would, would make the regulation too broad right. and it would hurt the innovative side. Um, and you know you can you can let the innovative side be free without compromising the consumer protection um, that would be enforced mm -hmm. upon the business side. The, so the exchanges, basically, people yeah, who actually hold the money. Yeah, so I guess that's a good thing. But I also don't think the exchanges should be forced to comply with this, mm. you know, god awful regulation either, uh, because. The, the business side is just as important as the innovation side because it's the, it's the businesses and the companies. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of people who have some, like, sour opinion about profits for whatever reason, but they're chasing profits, and as a result, they're, you know, spreading Bitcoin to more and more people. Mm. And that's just as important as making Bitcoin stronger as a currency. So how... If we're going to fight for one for freedom for one side of the community, but not for the other side, mm -hmm. uh, then that's not. Not only is that just like not very logical, but that's, you know, not really being fair. There, it's not a very moral thing to do, in my opinion. Yeah, but so like you understand the argument in favor of it, right? Like I, I mentioned earlier, like people, are you know are tired of the of the scams in the space it's it's just way too scammy i mean basically we're you know multiple times a year we we hear about these issues of over a million dollars worth of digital currency stolen so like it it creates like a like a, a slight atmosphere of fear among some in the community and like you know and and even if they aren't fearful like they're they're afraid of the negative perception that this will lead to among the public uh, and, and, and concerns of that nature. So like that, you know, 
but it's just it's just a matter of what's the best possible way of of fixing that problem right like is is the avenue that we want to take um having a particular governmental agency like it's not it's not the government it's not even it's not the national government it's just one particular state government like financial services agency in one state that is writing these regulations that you know they're trying to regulate an entire like digital economy that exists across the world globally and that can't even really be compared to any financial system that's come before it and and they're 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 trying to fit a square in a in a in a round hole um with these regulations at at with the threat of 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 taking your money through fines or even through through jail time so do we want an economy that um where where, where people hopefully act uh in a good way because they're afraid of the consequences um they're afraid of going to jail and that's why you know you have to threaten people to to be good stewards of other people's money in these businesses or do we want to uh you know let the bad actors weed out themselves um through the free market uh and and go go towards a more just society where people um act in their own self-interest and eventually you get people who run these companies who uh do run it very well because they are trustworthy because the free market has weeded out the other bad actors. I guess you know, it's it's two it's two different sides to the regulatory aspect. Self-regulation or, you know, random government agency regulation through force. Uh well, I mean, uh, that was probably a lot to I I would there. argue I would argue that these types of regulations don't stop scammers and and uh fraudulent activity. Like, you know, the the financial sector in the United States is probably the most regulated sector of the economy. And, um, you know, just one name that comes to mind when I think about big time scammers in that heavily regulated area of the economy is Bernie Madoff, you know. (laughs) Um, And then there's all these companies that we don't like. Let's see. Um the Koch brothers, which I think they get an unjustified amount of hate. Uh, but then there's Monsanto, all the major record labels who mm. like destroy YouTube videos. Yeah, who manipulate um, intellectual property law to do really draconian stuff on the yep. internet. And then we have the banksters and the credit card companies. Um, you know, everyone pretty much agrees that all us off uh and they're getting away with it um uh one thing that's that's close to home to me is um like the major energy provider in my state um they get most of their energy from coal and they just had like a huge ash spill into into a major river that affected a lot of people's water supply um and they got a slap on the wrist, and they had to pay a minimal, f- um, like you know, a nominal fee to the government. Mm. Um, and you know, they get all these companies that everybody hates. They get off so easily because of all these consumer protection regulations. Because all they have to do is, oh, pay a fee. Let us send a team of regulators into your company for a couple weeks to, mm. you know, straighten everything out with some and clipboards then, and papers and checkoffs yeah, and stuff. And the, and then when, once you finally uh, become compliant again, we're just going to tell everybody that it's okay to start buying your product again. Um, with these regulations, the market doesn't even have actors. You know, the the bad actors are protected. Mm. Um, so, I I like it when businesses like this fail and people find out that they're scammers because we're learning what to look out for in the future. Mm. Um, and there's, you know, there's no big brother type of agency to protect this scammer. He's going to get the full force of the community's opinion, and he's either going to be forced to um, repay everyone like the RoboCoin guy did, or he's going to 
be forced to go into hiding and never return like out like what might happen to Alex Green. Um, yeah. You know, there or is kind no... of like what Mark Carpolis did. Yeah. It, pretty much out um, of the public sphere. You know, there, there are no fines to pay and there is no government agency to tell everyone that it's OK now. You can keep buying from this company. There is there are no bailouts. There's no such thing as too big to fail. If you do something bad, you're gonna fail. You're gonna be punished for it. You're gonna fail. And I think that's way better than what we have in the mainstream economy. Mm. Yeah, you bring up an interesting um, potential scenario. Like down the road, once these, once the bit license does get implemented, and you start seeing digital currency companies applying for the license, getting the license being able to put like a badge of gigantic badge on their website saying bit license certified you know we follow all the regulations to a t dotting all our i's crossing all our t's um but then what happens when one of them does something crappy inevitably and uh, you know maybe it won't be as serious as the founder running away with over a million dollars um but maybe like there's a security breach um, where a hacker steals some money from some, some accounts or something relatively minor like that. First of all, is Benjamin Lasky going to do anything like to, to, you know, as some kind of countermeasure, uh, uh, you know, after the fact to punish that, to punish that organization? Um, and even if they do, like, how do you know that's going to prevent that type of thing from happening again in the future? Um, is is Benjamin Lasky going to send uh, some cybersecurity es- expert down to that company to like double check their systems and make sure it can't happen again? I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. But like, how 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 would they even check to make sure that these companies um, are totally secure after something bad happens? I mean. Maybe they could just take the license away, uh, you know, if if something is stolen. But they don't want to do that. They want the licensing fees. That's part of the whole reason for yep. this. <laughs> they want the they want the revenue for the for the state of New York. Um, so they're not going to be that um, enthusiastic about kicking people out of their system that they, that they just created. So, yeah, I think you're right. It, it is going to just provide like. Um, an unfair sense of legitimacy to the companies that simply have, you know, extra capital laying around to pay for the bit license, to pay for all its require requirements. Um, but hey, it's it's gonna get implemented anyway. Like we 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 know that it's gonna imp- get implemented in some form, in some way. Um, it's just a matter of speculation and a matter of, you know how how many comments that they actually listen to um whether or not they implement like all of the regulations or try and take out the most controversial ones like even if benjamin lasky said that it's not going to apply to developers and miners and people like that um if the law is vague enough to potentially include them in the language it doesn't really matter what Benjamin Lasky's opinion is. That yeah. law is going to be on the books. And he, he can just change his mind later if he wants to. Or exactly. the, the next the next superintendent can, you know, maybe be have a, you know, a more strict opinion towards it. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. Like the the law is on the books. It can potentially be applied to those people. So your plan is you're going to you're going to trust this one guy what he says he's going to use it for during the next what two three four years or so and then basically just i mean just hope that no one who's more of a dick than ben lasky comes in and starts you know really abusing that law to to then start going after developers going after miners and things like that um it's concerning it's concerning and i guess we got to kind of see how it's going to play out yeah but you know what in in the real world and the current state of affairs People want to feel safe, and um, they want the government to, you know, protect them and make them safe. And so they want these kinds of regulations. So, if we want to be really honest with ourselves, this type of regulation is going to help Bitcoin get more mainstream acceptance. Because mm-hmm. um, maybe if 
you know, some, you know, big time investors might get in on it. Mm. Uh, you know, employers might consider paying wages in Bitcoin or offering bonus options or something. We might have some more exchanges try to open up if they can afford it. But it'll it'll make it seem more legitimate, but it's really going to suck. And in the long run, um, it doesn't matter how legitimate it makes Bitcoin look because it's going to essentially provide a safe haven for scammers and it's going to hinder business and all the negative things we just talked about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a good point too. It, 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 it does provide um, a sense of legitimacy in a lot of people's eyes. You know, the people in the Bitcoin community who are pushing for this, um, well, they, they, they always make the argument in, in return, like, oh, we aren't pushing for it. We just recognize that it's something that's going to happen anyway. Yeah. And we're just trying to engage as much as possible uh, for when it does eventually happen. But, like, um, okay, pushing for it, trying to engage with them, whatever. Like, you are looking for some kind of favorable regulation that's 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 the goal um and i guess that that is important to to strive toward if there's gonna if there's gonna be regulation no matter what um hopefully it's good regulation it's kind of like choosing the lesser of two evils uh when you go to vote um kind of a necessary sacrifice you have to make yeah or it's like if the bully lets you choose if you can get punched in the face or in the stomach, <laughs> which one's gonna suck less? Yeah, uh, in that suck. case, I would be like, uh, I think I'll just I'll go over here. I'll go away <laughs> yeah. from you uh, <laughs> to to my own little corner, so I don't get punched anywhere. Hopefully, um, <laughs> or maybe maybe like either get punched in the face or um. Or I call you names for every day of the rest of the year or something stupid like that. I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. We'll, I don't know. We'll see what happens with the bit license. Um, Who knows? We might get a second commenting period. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But um, I, I, I doubt it at this point. <laughs> I think the the official comment period did end. Um did end a couple a few days ago yeah i think it was the 22nd maybe yeah so uh, so as as we speak um ben Lossky and his camaraderie of uh regulators are probably hashing out you know which parts they're gonna keep which parts they're gonna uh take out and um before the end of the year we'll see um what they what they come up with and then after that happens, we'll actually be able to see in practice, like all these theoretical arguments we've been making for months, we'll be able to see like um, which businesses actually start applying for the license, how many apply for the license, you know, who gets approved and who doesn't, um, you know, which businesses are not going to be part of the license are going to start, you know, keep operating normally anyway, um, how things might be different for them, uh, and then, you know, maybe we might see two sets of Bitcoin businesses kind of start evolving out of this. Like those who are completely set on uh, following regulations in order to like have that legitimacy aspect, uh, be able to get like mainstream, you know, institutional investors in because of the legitimacy. And then we'll have, you know, the like underground group of businesses who really aren't interested in trying to keep up with all the licenses um, who are doing more like potentially revolutionary stuff uh, with 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 money, basically, um, and then you know the scammers will still be in that group. You know, it'll it'll just hopefully people will um, become more conscious of of where they keep their Bitcoin and um, and not give it to let the sc scammers hold it as often. That's what I hope yep. for. I think I think the best way to um, get around all this stupid regulation is just to start handing out direct payments in Bitcoin, like you know, letting people choose some kind of payment option at their job for for Bitcoin. But um, 
you know, it's kind of a difficult thing to do because nobody is going to want to just like get their paycheck in Bitcoin if they don't even know what it is. And exchanges play a big role in spreading information about what Bitcoin is and how to use it. Mm. So it's like the only way we can get to this stage where exchanges aren't even needed is to make sure that the exchanges stick around. And the only way they're going to stick around is if they, you know, comply with these regulations. We're going to have a whole bunch of cronyism happen, just like happens uh, everywhere else in the economy where that's heavily regulated. Mm. Um, you know, it's, just, it's like the, Bitmoski is, he's definitely setting a, you know, a precedent here. There are a lot of governments looking at this bit license regulation because it's the first of its kind and they want to see how it works so they can use that information to implement their own licensing. So um, this is going to happen. It's going to be, you know, nationwide at some point. It's going to be global at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, they just really put us in a tight spot because, you know, cronyism is pretty much just inevitable at this point. Mm. Yeah, um, I pulled up. I pulled up Gavin Andreessen's AMA um, from Reddit uh, from a few days ago, and he actually mentioned uh, regulations in one of his answers. Uh, s- someone asked him, um, "What needs to happen for you to switch from Bitcoin is an experiment to Bitcoin is established?" Because yeah. Gavin Andreessen is one of the proponents of this mentality. I remember right? this one. Bitcoin is uh, is just an experiment it's, it's a grand you know digital currency experiment but like this thing has gotten pretty huge now it's 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 firmly in the public eye uh, people are aware of it now um but like it's still considered an, an experiment and he says that well to to you know consider it established um three things that we need number one regulatory clarity number two ease of use and number two, or number three, um, no single point of failure uh, security. So on that on that last point, um, people clarified after that that we are starting to get there with no single point of failure with things like multi-signature transactions um, that require you to approve a transaction with two out of three devices. That way, you know, one person can't steal your money, even if they hack into your uh, local wallet. But then, like the other things, like ease of use. Okay, we're get we're getting we're getting progress there uh, with better wallets, better designed wallets, and ev- and everything like that. Uh, but regulatory clarity is something that he says that we need um, for Bitcoin to go from ex- from an experiment to an established uh, currency. Um, but like you know, the problem with that is you don't want regulatory clarity if it's bad regulations, right? You want you want clear regulations um, that are you know totally favorable to Bitcoin across the board, and <coughs> the regulations are the same across many different jurisdictions. I don't see that happening. I just I I I, I think it's kind of like a, a wild goose chase to chase after regulatory clarity when like different you know nations and even different miniature states within those nations are going to have different regulations and they might be terrible regulations as we've seen in the bit license proposal um so like to say that uh bitcoin is not going to be established until there's regulatory clarity um like i'm just i'm just picking apart that one particular you know claim but like i would just say that it's it's kind of it's a it's a it's a pipe dream to to go after regulatory clarity for Bitcoin and hey the Bitcoin Foundation they're apparently putting a lot of resources into chasing that uh, pipe dream, but I just I just don't see regulatory clarity happening for uh, for you know maybe up to up to ten years or so because even if you win the bit license fight in New York and get reasonably favor- favorable regulations in New York um are you going to fight that same battle over and over in every of the 50 US states or hope that the United States adopts the you know the regulations you want and then you have to fight that same battle in other countries as well like i don't know i'm 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 of the 
mindset that like the people with the resources um would be best spending their their time and money um creating new revol revolutionary applications of actual code and things that you can do with the actual money instead of trying to like okay we want all governments in the world to have the perfect set of regulations for bitcoin and and then everything's going to be fantastic the public will see it as legitimate and we'll get tons of institutional investment from banks and all that stuff um hey if they honestly think that's that's possible and that can happen within you know um within the next 10 years i guess go for it prove me wrong i want to i want to see it happen but um i don't think it's very likely well, I think with that particular point on regulatory clarity, uh, what I've noticed is that Gavin Andreessen seems to be a lot more than some other people in the Bitcoin Foundation. Like I didn't, I didn't catch that. What he's what? Uh, I've, I've noticed. Him. I've noticed that he seems to be um, a little bit more realistic than some other people in the Bitcoin Foundation. For example, um, you know, Jim Harper, who thinks he, if he buddies up with uh, Ben Lasky enough, he'll, like, break through to him and uh, get him to yeah. pass the perfect regulation. Or that one guy, who I can't remember his name, who testified in front of the NYDFS saying that we need global and uniform regulation to make Bitcoin great. Um, I don't think Gavin Andreessen really thinks like that. And I think what I think what he meant by regulatory clarity was we just have to decide are we going to regulate it or are we not going to regulate it. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> because that uncertainty between is it going to be unrestricted or is it going to be regulated like everything else, it um, it makes... It makes developers reluctant to put their time and energy into it because they don't know what's going to happen to Bitcoin in the future. It makes potential users um, opt out of buying in because it could either uh, end up being a Wild West thing or a completely authoritarian Big Brother thing. And uh, it could be one of two extremes. And uh, things like that, it just it creates confusion i guess you could say and so what we have to clarify is is it going to be regulated or unregulated and then if we decide it's going to be regulated um it's obviously not going to be perfect every state every country is going to have different regulations but that's how it is with any any part of government or the economy every um city state and country has their own you know, unique regulations, but businesses find a way to deal with them. So I don't think that's really big, uh, a big deal. So I think what Gavin was saying was we just have to like put an end to the confusion. Um, that is, it's like creating a, as, uh, you know, people, people decide to cash out whenever they talk about regulation, but then, you know, with, when one certain regulation gets struck out, everybody cheers. But then there's other people who are super scared because it's unregulated. It's just a bunch of uncertainty about it that makes that makes it less legitimate. Mm. And so it's a question of just this black and white, free or controlled, right. not not perfectly controlled. So you're saying like there's some people in the community who who want to be controlled in a way. They're they're willing to give up a, a little bit of personal responsibility in order in order to achieve an extra sense of legitimacy that they couldn't have gotten without regulatory clarity. Well, I I think there's I mean yeah there's definitely those kinds of people but um like my main point I'm trying to make is that the fact that we're so you know back and forth on what we want to accomplish with Bitcoin in the future in terms of like, you know, regulatory clarity, it, it, it just makes people kind of uneasy about even, you know, experimenting with it because they don't know what's going to happen to it in the future because mm -hmm. we have, you know, one second we're like, oh, we're going to pass all this regulation and it's gonna, just going to be so safe. And then, you know, we have this whole other side of, 
of the debate where it's like, no, it needs to be completely unregulated and, and, um, and anarchistic. So it, it can just be an experiment in liberty. And it's just, um, that type of uncertainty just makes the whole community in general unstable and it, it makes it an experimental atmosphere because yeah. there's no, you know, there's no stability at all. It's either, you, you know, one of the, of the, ex, of the extreme or another extreme. And, uh, that makes the average person just uneasy about the entire thing. Yeah. So we like we just if we want to move from the experiment from the experimental stage to um you know the legitimate age we just have to decide what is bitcoin bitcoin going to be what are we going to do with it in terms of regulation. Mm. You know, I'm I'm of the of the mindset that like you you can have all these different all these different people who think that Bitcoin should be um, something that they you know that they they think it should be uh, you know this anarchistic uh, totally freedom thing. Then you have others who think that you know it should play ball with regulators, play ball with bankers, play by their rules and all that. And like these two sides um, can actually coexist um and have been coexisting for months and and in a way years um like even even if these regulations pass and all these rules get implemented and everything like there are still going to be tons of ways for the average person to uh buy bitcoin under the table um without anyone knowing uh there's always going to be a way to get a hold of it and and to send it to any website where you want to do any amount of things with your Bitcoin, whether it's going to be, you know, investing in stocks on, you know, counterparties, Medici platform or buying drugs on the dark net market or, you know, any of these other things that let span a whole wide range of like of, of morals and, and ideals and political mindsets and everything. And the great beauty of that, of Bitcoin is that all these things are possible, like within the same system, really. Like it's all it's all Bitcoin. It's all transactions happening on the network. It's just how you use it is 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 what you make of it. Um, even even if these regulations and everything get passed, even if, even if they get like fin uh, regulatory clarity uh, on on exactly what they want bitcoin overall to be like a, a payment system or or a, a store of wealth or whatever um the, it really comes down to how the user uses it because once you have bitcoin this is the most free um you know most freedom enabling financial instrument that has ever been invented and once you have some bitcoin in your wallet uh you can send that to literally any bitcoin address that exists on the whole bitcoin network and that you know all all of the various possibilities that come along with that so in a way it doesn't even really matter uh what the regulations come down to because um at the end of the day everyone has their bitcoin they can do whatever they want with it they can send it anywhere they want and as long as you're not um hurting anyone with it and you know paying for an assassin or something crazy like that to, to take someone out <laughs> even if it's like a political figure like don't don't kill people or or hurt anyone um and also don't steal you know don't don't steal other people's bitcoin um like use it to to do transactions with with literally anyone you want in the world once open bazaar gets up up and running you'll be able to uh, transact freely with anyone in the world using Bitcoin, um, buying and selling literally like any product you can imagine, as long as you can put it in the box and ship it to someone uh, safely and securely, um, then you can transact using Bitcoin. Or it doesn't even have to be a physical thing. It can be digital goods transacted uh, with Bitcoin through Open Bazaar or other platforms. So like... <laughs> like we i mean we we debate a lot about you know the bit license and and how the regulations are going to impact the overall industry but at the end of the day this is you know no matter what they implement this is still the most free currency that's ever been invented and you can do whatever you want with it so um 
I fucking love Bitcoin. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, that, that was a nice little rant you Thank went you. on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you um, want to move on to the next topic? What are we going to talk about next? Yeah, I guess. Side chains? Yeah, let's get into side chains. Side chains, side chains, side chains. Um, so this is this is a topic that's been talked about for like uh, um, a few months already uh, for upgrading Bitcoin. It's kind of it's referred by some as a Bitcoin 2.0 project, um, but now uh, this company called Blockstream has released the official white paper detailing um, what side chains are, how they're going to work, and all these all this stuff. And I read some of the paper to get a gist of it. Um, and read some comments on Reddit as well to try and get what this is all about. Because honestly, I still don't fully quite grasp it the same way I didn't fully uh, grasp Bitcoin when I first got involved. Um, Sidechains are pretty complicated when you get into the thick of it. But um, I'm going to try and summarize it the best I can. Um, basically, sidechains are in addition to the core Bitcoin protocol. And... In order to do that, they're going to have to soft fork Bitcoin, um, uh, you know, update the Bitcoin core code, get um, wallets to develop, you know, ways of incorporating side chains, recognizing that they that they exist, and incorporating ways for Bitcoin to interact with side chains. Um, but once that happens, people will be able to choose a certain amount of their Bitcoin, send it to a certain address lock it away so they can't do anything with it. It's effectively just frozen in time. And for that, they will get a certain amount of tokens on a side chain uh, at a fixed uh, rate. So it's not going to be a, a market rate based on whoever will, will, whoever will pay for it. It'll be set by the coders of the side chain how much of their token you'll get for however much of Bitcoin. Um, Kind of, kind of the same way that Ethereum set um, a certain price for Ether uh, for Bitcoin during their IPO sale. Except this will be done actually in in a program w with code, um, trustless in a trustless manner. So you'll get a certain amount of these tokens on the side chain, and with those, you'll be able to do whatever that side chain was designed to allow you to do. Um, whether it's um, privacy measures. Um, to to make your transactions more anonymous within that side chain, um, I've seen descriptions that say that side chains can be made to mimic things like Darkcoin or Monero. Um, Monero, which uses ring signatures to anonymize transactions. So stuff like privacy, and then also like more experimental stuff uh, that you wouldn't necessarily um, see. Or you wouldn't, you would never see in in Bitcoin itself. Um, this will supposedly allow Bitcoin developers to test things better with an actual community of users before updating the overall Bitcoin protocol with it. Um, and really, like it, the whole range of crazy altcoins that exist today uh, can be implemented as side chains directly onto Bitcoin itself, um, basically eliminating eliminating the need for these separate blockchains and also eliminating the need for um, altcoin exchanges really if if you have side chains that can do everything altcoins can do and you have a program that can exchange bitcoin automatically for these sidechain tokens then you don't need exchanges as much anymore um, those are a couple of the promises there's some drawbacks as well that people have pointed to concerns concerns about mining and stuff like that um, but that's, you know, that's that's basically uh, what I can boil it down to based on what I understand at this time. Um, so, you, yeah, go ahead, uh, jump in. You want to, what do you think about side chains? Yeah, the whole thing's pretty much um, over my head. But it sounds really cool. I mean, it sounds like a, a way to allow for experimentation with new uh additions or changes to the Bitcoin protocol without actually changing the protocol and um, mm -hmm. you know getting a <clears throat> consensus from the miners to implement these changes I think it's also going to 
or it could um, eliminate a lot of the politics that goes into implementing changes to the Bitcoin protocol um, because everybody has an opinion on what Gavin Andreessen or whoever else wants to wants to do um, and as you know, Mike Hearn said several months ago that is a huge reason why Bitcoin development has pretty much ground to a halt. Yeah. Because it's just become so political. Um, but since with sidechains you wouldn't have to change the entire Bitcoin protocol, there really would be no politics needed because, hey, I'll just go, you know, make a sidechain and test this application out. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, then nobody has lost anything. Yeah. Um, so you know that's pr that's pretty cool, um, and I don't really understand why anyone would be against that. I know, you, like you mentioned something about mining, and I read that it creates a potential for mining centrals. Yeah. Uh, but you know, again, like I said, I don't really know. It's like side chains, you know, kind of over my head. So mm -hmm. I don't really understand the arguments against it because it sounds like a like a pretty cool addition to me. Yeah, it's really technical stuff. Most of it was over my head as well. I kind of had to go to the comments and, and kind of piece together the context analysis to, to get what people are talking about. Because apparently, apparently um, Bitcoin developer Peter Todd has actually been working on a similar concept called tree chains. Um, which is which is a different implementation, but can achieve some of the same goals as side chains, but it's but it's but it's significantly different. Um, and side chains is, is the furthest in development because they actually have a white paper released. But like um, this is like you know looking at the like looking at the big, bigger picture like this is a this is a sign of how bitcoin is you know the most amazing currency ever created it's the first programmable currency which means that you know really super intelligent developers can go in there um with with new additions that they've you know given a lot of thought to that have been subjected to rigorous debate and basically add it into bitcoin and make bitcoin better um, allow people to experiment with it more experiment with you know different possibilities that digital currencies can do that bitcoin itself can't necessarily do and you don't have to rely on alternative um blockchains which is what alt altcoins are all about um you know i'm i'm actually surprised that like we haven't seen a like a greater like hostile reaction from the altcoin community um towards this uh, cause like if, if, if I follow sidechains correctly and if it is implemented in, in how I envision it could, it could be, um, that would destroy altcoins. Um, like if someone were, if someone were to like copy all of the Ethereum code and create a sidechain that mimics Ethereum where anybody at any time can just... Uh, basically uh, convert their Bitcoin into into Ether um, and be able to, to go back as well. That's the two-way peg. Be able to go back to Bitcoin at any, t at any time you want um, right there on their computer. Like, then what is Ethereum worth anymore? Is, like, is Ethereum still worth $15 million if a uh, sidechain can accomplish that exactly the same way? In a in a more efficient way with a better on ramp into um, into that system, and now obviously this is like totally hypothetical. No one is cre you know no one is creating an an Ethereum for side chains. Side chains aren't even released yet or in any functional um, um, you know matter. Uh, but like it brings up the question like what is what is the future for altcoins? If any any altcoin that exists today could potentially be a side chain in the future like do you, well, do you think they can coexist wouldn't there um still be a place for altcoins um to experiment with different um mining algorithms because wouldn't the side chains on the bitcoin blockchain still operate on proof of work actually so, they they could do proof of stake 
I read that somewhere. And I, and okay, I, I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's true. Because that was, that was really the only thing I could think of. Um, because, you know, literally anything can be built as, you know, a side chain to the Bitcoin blockchain. So Redcoin could be, you know, just a side chain on Bitcoin, Purecoin, Darkcoin, all the other ones. So really the only thing I could think of that would still create a place of legitimacy in the crypto community for altcoins would be to, you know, experiment with, with different mining algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can also do that with sidechains, then yeah, I don't see how altcoins would still have a place in the community unless people just want to maintain those altcoins, you know, just for community reasons. Like, yeah. you know, the like Dogecoin has like, you know, very active community that's, you know, very loyal to their currency. Um, yeah. So then like the network effect based, basically. Yeah. So then it would just be, you know, people would keep using altcoins just for the sake of using them because they like, the, they like having the altcoin. They like the community around it. Yeah, but there would like be they might have the wallets already and all that. Yeah. And, so, but I, but but you know I I agree with you. There would be no like, you know, technical or functional reason for altcoins to still exist when you could do when a side chain can do whatever altcoin altcoins can do. Yeah. On on with with Bitcoin as a backbone, basically, mm -hmm. with the you know the the largest user base um, by far of of any digital currency, largest user base, um, largest network effect, uh, largest pool of developers and talent and professionals that you can tap into, um, and you know the largest potential um, pool of customers as well to your side chain. If if it's so if it's super easy to buy into the side chain by just locking your Bitcoin in, into a particular address, you know, using the you know side chain program, or you know even what you know if, if blockchain integrates side chains, you can just lock in your Bitcoin that way using the wallet that you are already using. Um, that opens up like a huge huge um, market of potential investors into your side chain that wouldn't normally be there if you were on an alternative cryptocurrency blockchain because you know to get those you've got to go through um a centralized exchange like we talked about earlier you have to trust um that that mint pal or or, or cripsy or whatever it is um you know won't run away with your bitcoin during during the middle of your exchange uh, while you're trying to get some dark coin or myriad coin or light coin or doge coin so um you know i'm all for it i'm all for it like i i can't wait until this gets implemented it's it's super interesting um and like uh it's 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 a constant evolution um in this in this new digital economy um like we were you know, it's a lot of people are probably still just getting used to the fact that there that there's Bitcoin, and then there's you know these hundreds of other cryptocurrencies which do a million, you know, different things like s tiny little minor tweaks to their code, or even no tweaks at all to the code, just copy of Bitcoin. And now this new thing comes on comes along where it's like, oh, uh, we might be able to do all of that except directly on Bitcoin itself. By the way, so. Yeah, um, try and process that brand new uh, cryptocurrency investor. So, yeah, it'll um, be interesting another, to see what happens. Another thought I just had is that uh, this would, you know, probably, you know, s partly because it would make altcoins completely irrelevant um, functionally, but it would also, you know, make the development community around Bitcoin bigger because you have all these people doing altcoins to try new things um, simply because they just it would be impossible to get that change into the Bitcoin blockchain um, but since they can just do it as a sidechain and they have nothing to lose um, you know 
you know, why not do that? Because, you know, making an entirely new altcoin is risky too because you have to find a team of developers, you know, probably have to pay them. You have to do, then you have to do an IPO for your coin just to get it into the hands of, of people so they can use it and you can figure out how it works. Um, but then you have people's money at stake and if it ends up not working, everyone's mad at you because they just threw away their money. Yeah. Now they can just go and do a side chain, um, build their application they want to test. They don't have to worry about getting, you know, funding to get their cir- their altcoin in circulation because people can just, you know, put a, put a little Bitcoin uh, in to transfer yeah. whatever over to get tokens or whatever, and they can play with it and then get their Bitcoin back. Um, and it just makes a much safer and easier way to experiment. So, yeah, the development community could be a lot bigger because of side chains. Yeah, it'll all, it'll have a lot of interesting economic effects as well. Like, um, you mentioned, like, funding for the developers. Um, as I understand it, uh, once you lock in your Bitcoin and then get the side chain tokens... Um, that locked in Bitcoin it just stays there. It doesn't go to the developers or anyone involved with that side chain. It's just, you know, it's still on the Bitcoin blockchain technically. It's just that you can't use it. Um, and it's still it's still your address as well. And you can get that Bitcoin back again once you exit the side chain system. So, like, I guess developers, if they use side chains, in a way, it'll actually make it harder um, to get funding for projects. I mean, un- unless you unless you st- do an IPO in addition to the sidechain release, um, th- there's no way to really uh, like sell people um, your your coin um, because they can just do it easily themselves by locking in their Bitcoin. I guess maybe you could sell it to them at a, at a lower rate. Than, than what you set the rate as on the side chain. But like these are all questions you know that are raised now with with, yeah. with side chains, and we don't know how this is all going to play out. Well, maybe this will be you know a uh, time for Lighthouse to come in and fill mm-hmm. the gap. Because uh, you know most a lot of most people are really skeptical of altcoin IPOs. They're generally associated with scams. Um, so, you know, I would argue that it's, that it would be hard to get funding regardless. Um, Mm. and if you could get a funding out of an IPO, it'd probably not be that much. So, I mean, maybe this would be the perfect time for some kind of crowdfunding thing to happen and and they wouldn't have to do IPOs at all. So, you know, this lighthouse thing sounds pretty cool because it's decentralized. Um, decentralized crowdfunding and, uh, Maybe that could be a thing now. Yeah, hopefully. Um, you know, Lighthouse was announced uh, earlier this year, and I believe it it was released by Mike Hearn. But currently, he's the only person who is uh, who has created a platform on top of Lighthouse, which is called Venumeris, and he's using that to um, try and get funding for projects that that he's working on. And um, as as far as I know, I don't think my current is working on um, side chains or anything like that. But like, like fast forward to like a year from now, and like once once side chains are are up and running, and people are gonna start creating side chains for for experimenting with new algorithms and and things like that. Um, hopefully, at the same time, there's gonna be a vast array of uh, crowdfunding options as well for projects. Like Lighthouse is just one of them. And a few weeks ago, we talked about um, uh, Roger Veer's project, um, or his, you know, not really a project, but it's his website for bounty hunting that he, that he yeah. opened, where he crowdfunds money um, to catch criminals and thieves and stuff like that. But like, you know, that's this. These are the early days still in terms of crowdfunding. Um, so, hopefully, a year from now, we we have a pretty good array of options for like um, funding different projects, funding uh, you know works of art that you might want to um, get funded. Uh, all that stuff is is in development and is all all made infinitely more possible 
by the by the decentralized and programmable nature of, of Bitcoin. So constant evolution of this space. That's one of my favorite things about this space is um, the constant evolution and how things are always getting better, basically. Uh, people are always looking for new innovative, wa innovative ways to um, accomplish things that were never really tried before in the area of finance because it just wasn't even possible to do any of this stuff on a mass scale in, in a trustless manner where you aren't going to get st scammed at least most of the time if, if you, you know, play your cards right. Um, so yeah, it's, it'll be exciting to see um, how this keeps evolving in the future. And um, yeah, that's what we talk about every week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, do we have anything else? No. Um, Call it a wrap for the yeah, show. Yeah, I think that's that's about it. So, um, thanks for listening, everyone, to the Coin Brief Podcast. This has been episode 20. This is your open source for digital currency news. And we'll be back next week with some more discussion on the latest topics and controversies and scandals and developments and innovations, all, all that crazy stuff in the digital currency space. So, thanks, everyone, for listening. And um, follow us on Twitter, like the video. Uh, comment if you like um, join the discussion uh, please you know if, if anything we got wrong about like side chains or anything like that um, help us out comment uh, clarify some stuff and um, yeah keep listening and uh, have a have a great week everyone